Wow, so we're in Lancaster. We are, we're in Pennsylvania. Lancaster? Lancaster. I don't know how to say anything. I don't talk for a living. Come on. <laughs> I went to college at Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. So this is uh, it's wonderful. Wonderful to be back in PA again. I'm very, very honored to be here. I ain't never been here before, so be nice. You guys have the best pickles in the world, I swear to goodness. Yeah, your pickles. market rocks. Oh my gosh. Pickles and pretzels. I'm never leaving. I mean, <laughs> Really, she might leave me for your pickles. So. <laughs> that didn't sound right, I'm sorry. And yet there's an ounce of truth to that. Yeah. <laughs> I have to so for, does anybody here not know who we are? It's okay if you don't. You can raise your hand. You just came in here for a nice nap. It's all good. Yay, all right, honestly, Yay. love that. So for you, sir, <laughs> We are voice actors, and she's a director, and a yeah. singer, and she does a million other things. She's probably a brain surgeon, too. I only know how to voice act. Yes. Uh, based in Los Angeles, and we've been doing it for 25, 30 years. Like and what have you worked on, Mr. Bloom? Well, together, we worked on Cowboy Bebop. Wow. And for those of you who don't know, Mary was my director on that show. Yeah. It was her first directing gig, and it was my first leading role. And she played Julia on the show to my I was so in love with Spike. I was like, if we ever hear or see this Julia person, I'm playing her. <laughs> and then we've been friends for like 18 years, and uh, we got together as a couple three years ago. So. Yeah! Yeah, so Spike and Julia together again. Yeah. And yeah, what have you worked on? Well, uh, currently, uh, I'll, pr I'll promote the new stuff. Uh, I'm directing Tangled, the series. So, uh, please watch it. It's so great. We got the whole cast back from the movie, and it's so much fun. And tonight, we've got James Monroe Eigelhart, who's uh, premiering, and he was the genie in, Ham in, uh, in Hamilton. <laughs> and Lafayette and uh, Jefferson in Aladdin. So, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. And Steve plays Attila Buckethead in Tangled the Sea. Yeah. I'm um, one of the pub thugs. It's pretty fun. Yeah. And then we're also working together on Star Wars Rebels. Yeah. yeah. So I play Zeverelios. And I play Governor Price. Yes. Yeah. She's evil. Don't cross her. She has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Which is why I kind of like you. It's terrible. I appreciate that, no woman. So we were I, talking with Dave Filoni, and I said, what, what redeeming char uh, characteristics or qualities does she have? And he's like, none. You have none. <laughs> none at all. Thrawn loves art. You love power. Yeah, That's she's pure evil. I get to play stormtroopers, though, so I play for that side, too. It's all good. You know, we have a very clean understanding. Yeah, but this is an anime con, and we've done a lot of anime. We sort of cut our teeth in the industry on anime. Yes. Uh, starting with Cowboy Bebop. Yeah. And I think then the next series we did was close to Wolf's Rain. Wolf's Rain. Or did you? Yeah. yeah. I played, I directed it, and uh, I, I kind of stalked Steve over the years in terms of casting, because every time, like, he was uh, cast as Lord Darsha, and I was like, well, maybe I should play Lady Jagera, you know, <laughs> so that we could always be opposite each other. Which yeah. Was really fun. And then Digimon, we did. I love Digimon. <laughs> Any Digimon fans? Yeah. Nice. Digi-evolution. Yeah, so I directed that show for a number of years. and You played a bunch of Mons, too. I was, every, like, every Mon that we couldn't find someone for, they just, I just jumped in the booth. So I, eventually I took over for Gato Mon and lots of Mons. Mon, Mon, Chick, Chick, Mon! Very strange Mon. Uh, and Rika's mom. A couple of moms, yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, we did Digimon Tamers, yes. and then what was the fourth season called? Digimon... I don't remember. Evolution. Evolution thank you. Testing you. You did well. I don't remember that show. I played JP on that show. Anybody remember JP? I love JP. I was JP when I was younger, so I yeah. looked exactly like him. <laughs> Super insecure. It's yeah. exactly who I am. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, not anymore, but no. now I'm totally secure, but Dude. I wasn't back then. <laughs> Only took 56 years. Yeah. Yeah. And Naruto, we did a lot of Naruto. For yeah, any Naruto fans? Yeah, sweet. Woo! So I, yes, it's Abuza. Thank you. <laughs> what about Orochimaru? Yeah. 
Yes, I actually played Grass Ninja that turned it. Grass Ninja was sort of a Kate Mulgrew. <laughs> I love doing Kate Mulgrew every now and then because I'm a huge Star Trek fan. And who turned into Orochimaru? Yes, and he directed like 17,000 episodes, right? years of directing on Naruto. I think I directed 560 some odd episodes before the fabulous and wonderful Sam Regal got me in my foot in the door at Disney and I've been directing original animation ever since, which is really yeah, fun. She's big time director now, people. Yo. Right. Yo. And I play D and D every now and then too. <laughs> You guys, right. you guys critters? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yes! Nice. So, uh, Steve and I started, our, for those of you who don't know, there's this amazing show of nerdy, pardon my French, ass voice actors who play uh, D and D on Thursday nights on Geek and Sundry Twitch channel uh, called Critical Role. <laughs> it's Laura Bailey, Travis Willingham, Talison Jaffe, Liam O'Brien, Sam Regal, Marisha Ray, Ashley Johnson, and Matt Mercer is the DM. So it is. On dedicated role playing, and it's something I was so intimidated to do. And they threw me in as a, a level 11 tiefling warlock, and uh, I killed a couple of things. Felt good. She's a dragon slayer. I'm a dragon slayer. Yeah. And a beholder. A beholder. Beholder. Yeah. Yes. Apparently, it was in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> <laughs> so we started our own campaign. Yes. So tell, tell, us, tell us about your character in our D&D <laughs> campaign, because we're playing now with Brian Foster, who is on Tox Machina. He is Tox Machina. Yes. Uh, the love of Ashley Johnson's life. Yes. And then uh, our fabulous friend, uh, Bobby Hall, who is a uh, rapper named Logic. You guys know Logic? Yeah, Logic is actually playing D&D &D with us at our house now, so yeah. it's, it's amazing. amazing. He's my little brother. And Will Friedle, who played Cash on uh, Critical Role, yeah. he's also Boy Meets World, he is boy. Yeah, and Shiloh. And Shiloh, writer, that's right. Yeah, uh, Shiloh Strong. Shiloh Strong, writer's brother. Yeah. Yeah, amazing filmmaker. Yeah, and Jen Murrow. Jen Murrow, who is a, uh, a writer for uh, the new Forces of Destiny, which is a really cool thing. They just announced Star Wars, Star Wars Celebration. And it's all these uh, sort of shorts about uh, all the, the female heroines of, uh, of Star Wars. So you've got Padme and yeah. uh, 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 Ahsoka and uh, Leia and Rey and yeah. uh, Sabine and Hera. And hopefully if it goes over well, they'll do one for the villains, too, of us torturing small animals when we were children. Uh, oh, no, no. Nerfs. Little nerf herders. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, that's, so we have a very fun time. Who do you do? What, what do you do? Who do you play? What do I do? Oh, do you guys know a game called Dragon Age? Yes. Do, you, do you remember a guy named Ogren? He was, he was a kind of a drunk dwarf who always said, fart me a lullaby and stuff like that. Well, so that's who I modeled my character after, and he used, and Ogren used to talk about ass chaps. He used to say that all the time. So my my new character's name is Azure Chaps, <laughs> <laughs> and he's a drunken dwarf, and he actually has a little tail. Um, it, it's unexplainable. Nobody knows why. His face is tattooed. He's he's he brews his own mushroom ale. It's it's uh, it's pretty crazy. So anyway, we're taking that as deep as we can possibly go, and hopefully we're going to put that on a stream somewhere soon, yeah. so you guys can see that, it'll be pretty fun. And I play a Griffin Erendil, who is sort of based on Queen Elizabeth from The Crown, so she's very sort of in here, but a really mean uncle cursed her with wild magic. So every now and then she rolls on the table and Jersey comes out, how you doing, bada bing, burning hands, you're all dead. What just happened? You know, so she's yeah. a schizophrenic wild sorcerer who has no idea that she's been cursed. Yeah, Jersey is terrifying. I'm Jersey's sorry. awesome. Everybody levitate. Ba boom! Yeah. Why are we floating? <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. So, do we find a microphone for you guys? We have a microphone. All right. Do you guys have some burning questions? If you do, we're going to yeah. Oh, right turn up here. The lights off. Thank you so much. It, yeah, that's great. It's so great. We can. We love to see you your guys. faces. So, uh, whose first Zenkai Con is this? Yes. Oh, there's a lot. Wow. This is awesome. Amazing. And all right, let's find out who traveled the furthest. Uh, Where did you come from? Texas. Okay. It's pretty far. Jersey. Jersey, baby. Yeah, yo. Burning hands, baby. Nice. Burning hands. Oof. Sweet. What part of Jersey? Orange County. I was from Essex County growing yeah. up. Short hair. Wow, Jersey okay. Loud. Jersey Loud. It's amazing, dude. 
Jersey strong and loud. That's, that's like a superpower right there. It is. All right, we have our. <laughs> all right, we have our first victim. Come on up to the mic. First of all. Uh, yeah, it's on. Yes, you're good. Okay, uh, Camden County for me, Jersey. Yay, Camden nice. County! Yay. Jerry Hill area, anyone? But okay, yep. anyone? My grandparents were Point Pleasant. Awesome. Oh, awesome. All right, a comment then, a question related to uh, Cowboy Bebop. First of all, Steve, I did see you signed my autograph at, at Anime USA 2009. I'm cosplay comedian Joe, or was at the time, and you said you knew who I was. I just wanted to thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure, man. And, and also, Mary, uh, down at uh, Anime USA 2010 in Katsukon, you signed some of my Outlaw Star stuff. She played Hilda, by the way. Hot Eyes Hilda. Yes. yes, and I just wanted to thank you too for that. My question was this. Uh, so obviously, since you're so in the with Cowboy Bebop, I, act, I cannot believe I forgot that we're, uh, forgot to include some Cowboy Bebop sa scenes in this panel that I'm doing. Inspirational slash uplifting moments in anime, uh, 1015 Tomorrow Live uh, 2. If you two, would you like to... Plug uh, your stuff, dude. Seriously, that okay. sounds awesome. There's good. You know what I love about anime is that it is, that it is inspirational. It's, it can also be very dark. But on the other side of that, there's very inspirational stuff. So you've got a panel about inspirational anime? Yeah, yeah uh, 10, 15, uh, tomorrow morning, live 2. Uh, I was going to ask like, if you guys uh, would be like at the Q&A like, interested in sharing a scene from Cowboy Bebop that you thought was inspirational slash uplifting. But apparently you guys are like really... There's books. There's books. Uh, okay, I understand. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm so happy that you two are together. It's awesome. Thanks, man. Thank Appreciate you. that. Are there any inspirational good. moments from Inspirational Bebop? moments? Oh, yeah. You said it wrong. Yeah, there are lots of insp aspirational, aspirational, aspirational moments. Inspirational. Yeah, well, there are a lot of inspirational moments for me in that show. I mean, one of, one of the moments was very transformational for me in the movie, uh, in the scene with Elektra. Do you guys remember that? In where, the jail. In the jail cell, yeah, where Spike had to, had to actually get vulnerable. That was a turning point for me as an actor. And so, yeah, I would say that's very inspirational. She taught me how to act in those moments. And or, or how to access that part, because that was something that I was afraid to look at. Because as you actors out there know, to get vulnerable and be yourself is the hardest thing to do. So, yeah, yeah I would say that was very inspirational. Yeah, I think people always think as, a, as an actor you put on a performance, but actually what you do is you dig deep inside and find something inside of you that's honest. And you've got to start with being honest as any character, even if it's a goofy, silly voice, even if it's a tiny little fluff of air, you know, you still have to start with some some kind of truth. Yes. Usually beans. <laughs> Hi. Hi, how are you guys? Good, how are you? Uh, um, happy early birthday to Mr. I know, it's Steve's birthday tomorrow. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> I'm four years old. It's four years old. Uh, well, my, my question is for uh, Steve. Um, Besides, like, Bang or anything, you know, that's well known, uh, do you have a personal favorite quote of Spike's? Yes, I do. Well, can I hear it? <laughs> yes, you can. I love the kind of woman that can kick my ass. Go on, live with one. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for using the A word, moms and dads, but it's in the movie. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I uh, love your work, by the way. Uh, Thank you. I have a question. What would be the worst experience in your career? The worst experience, experience in our career? Uh, oh. Traffic. Traffic. <laughs> Actually, it was like one of the last auditions I had for on camera. It's like, I'm a firm believer in you are exactly where you're supposed to be at any point, even if it feels terrible. So I knew I was supposed to be in LA, but I kind of had a feeling that I wasn't supposed to be doing what I was doing, which was on camera career. I was really miserable. I wasn't happy doing it. And, I had this terrible last audition with the celebrity who, ah, just like one of those where you walk in and if you ever just feel like you're just an object and you're just some guy that looks you up and down and like goes back to reading his paper. And at that point I realized, I don't want to do this anymore, but I'm here, so I'm supposed to be here. So what am I supposed to do, universe? Next week I got a call to direct Cowboy Bebop. So it's actually the worst thing, which turned into the best thing. I saw this thing, recently, uh, and I posted it, on, I think, on Twitter or something, uh, about what it's like to jump out of a plane. And Will Smith got up and talked about what it was like to jump out of a plane. And you stand there with your toes at the edge of a plane on the lip, and the door is open, and you're about to jump out, and it's that moment of abject fear. 
and you just think to yourself, why was I so scared? Because on the other side of that is pure bliss. It's like pure, absolute bliss. So in that moment when uh, I realized I don't want to be doing this anymore, what should I be doing? And I got the call to direct Cowboy Bebop, the voice in my head said, you're going to fail. Don't do it. And I did it anyway, and I jumped out of the plane, and it was pure bliss. So I guess, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I guess at the end of anything that's awful that happens, it's supposed to be, because it leads you into something that is just the opposite a lot of the times. So, well, I'll give you that answer. That's true. That's a great answer. I don't think I've really had a terrible thing happen in voiceover, knock on wood. I mean, I've had some ridiculous things happen before. I've passed out in an audition because I screamed too hard. And I've thrown up in, in the studio before when I was trying to belch on command. <laughs> Stuff like that. But really nothing terrible. Other, probably the worst thing is when I lose my voice. Um, we used to, when we were working on Digimon uh, back in the old days, there were some of my younger characters, Kenta, I think, JP, and Paramon, which is way up here. I can't even do them today. Uh, but if I would be recording something like Wolverine earlier in the day, and I'd blow my voice out, I'd come back into the room and try to do this, and this would come out. So That's when I'd send you home. And then she'd send me home, yeah. And I always felt like I was letting people down. So that's really probably the only disappointing thing for me other than the traffic, which is just Sucks. miserable trying to get from place to place. Man, L.A. traffic. Is the traffic here that bad? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Depends on what yeah. time of day. Potholes. Potholes! Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that people are, are making them into planters, which is kind of... Have you seen that? <laughs> the, like the, the city comes out and spray paints them so you can see them when you're driving, so people will come out with a mound of dirt some flowers oh, that's a good idea. in the middle of the road. Wow. <laughs> Plant a tree. A little ecosystem little tree. there for other people to run over. Fantastic. Okay, fire away. Oh. Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask Mary if she remembered working with Samuel L. Jackson on the Afro Samurai video game. Yes. <laughs> Sam Jackson. He was, I got, I directed a, a, the Afro Samurai game and Sam came in and did uh, uh, Afro and Ninja Ninja at the same time, so we had two different mics. He would be really quiet when he was doing Afro. And then he'd get up in here for, you know, for Ninja Ninja. And it was, it was an amazing experience. That was one of those I was terrified. There are two people I've been terrified to direct. Uh, Ron Perlman and Ron Perlman. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Ron Perlman is a scary dude. He's a sweetheart of a guy, but, it, you know, he's just he's big. And, uh, uh, but Sam Jackson was amazing. He was absolutely amazing, and uh, I was honored to direct him. I'm pretty sure the minute he left the studio, I, we all jumped up and down and squeed like little girls, <laughs> which he probably heard, which isn't very professional on my part, but it was a really beautiful uh, experience. He was amazing, and he, he gave as good as he took as good as he gave. So we gave each other a lot of grief. I always feel like that's a test sometimes. Like people will test you, you know, with kind of being, you know. I don't know, uh, giving you a little sass, and if you give it back, you're like, oh, okay, so we can play now, it's all cool. So, and that's how he was, he was amazing, and very professional, and just an unbelievable actor. And Afro Samurai, no, it's not coming back, I'm thinking of Samurai Jack. Oh, it's all Samurais. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been flying a lot lately, so. It's been brought to our attention that this was actually billed as a uh, viewing of Cow We Up with a commentary. You wanted to see if you wanted to pause and do that for an episode, or you want to continue with Q&A? Oh, that's Q and A. We're we're, we're not we're not watching. Commentary. It was originally billed. The panel's billed as a commentary watching Cowboy Bebop. We can oh. do that, or we can continue with Q and A. We were not told about that. Yeah, yes, it was just brought to our attention. It's up to you guys. Q and A. Q and A. All right. Thanks, All right. Jersey. Jersey says Q and A. <laughs> Bergen County says Q and A. So we're gonna burn in hands. Q and A. Burn in hands. <laughs> Q and A. It is. You guys win. Sorry, guys. <laughs> hey. How you guys doing? Really well. How are you? How are you? Um, this question is for Steve. Yes, sir. <laughs> weird hearing myself. I know. It's weird, right? Um, I just want to tell you, I think you got... I'm a big anime fan. I think you got one of the best voices uh, in the animes. Oh, and, thanks, um, man. One in particular was Amon from The Legend of Korra. Yeah. Amon the Pope. Just wondering if you could uh, say something from, from, from 
Like, uh, actually, I have a whole sheet of stuff for him on. <laughs> He's so prepared. Because I'm on stage. Oh. I'm on a quest for equality. I'm on a boat. I'm on a bender. I'm on a tight schedule. My favorite dessert, chocolate amons. No. I'm sorry, I'm unable to answer that. No. I'm opening up a new spiritual center on Air Temple Island, simply called a monastery. <laughs> Benders hate the first day of the week. Why? Because it's a Monday. <laughs> Why the mask? Amonimity, of course. Try the Amon butter, it's delicious. Favorite insect? A monarch butterfly. <laughs> Favorite part of a movie? A montage. Favorite. <laughs> All right, that's enough. You've been purified. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> Jersey just fried me right off the stage. I killed me. Oh. <laughs> and I hot. <laughs> well, it was an honor to both meet the major and Ogren. Oh, thank you. It's like, but it's like, I got a, a more of Steve thing because I love uh, Dragon Age and Ogren. I always take him any quest. Oh, thanks, pal. Yeah. But I, this, Look out for nug humpers. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid nug humper. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> But this is for Steve, uh, this is for Arwen. So, did you ever get your pants back from the dog? Did I get my <laughs> pants back? Yeah. No, they ate my eyes. <laughs> Didn't get your pants because they ate your eyes? Yes, it's a thing. It's all, the dog. it's all about the Schlitz, right? Oh, the dog. Yeah. I shit sh the Schlitz, the Schlitz are slit. <laughs> exactly. I ramble, I can't help it. <laughs> Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that there's no question in my mind that Cowboy Bebop will be required watching for any serious anime fan in the next 20, 40, 60 years. This is absolutely going to be, if you want to be a serious anime fan or historian or anything considered yourself knowledgeable, you will have to be familiar with this particular series. Uh, there are obviously a number of attributes of Cowboy Bebop that's contributed to this. Certainly the, uh, the art, the uh, plot development, the character, uh, voice acting all have done this. But there's one aspect of it that I think has been really overlooked and I think it actually has also contributed to its uniqueness and that is its soundtrack. Oh, the music. Yes, the music it is absolutely still uh, very unique in my opinion. So, the question for both of you, if you can answer it. First, what led, what artistic decisions led to the use of a jazz soundtrack, which at that time was very revolutionary and, uh, and it did a, a wonderful job of setting, in my, in my mind, the emotional tone of the series. And the second is, why has this soundtrack approach not been adopted more widely by other anime series? Because I have always felt that this was a very effective uh, soundtrack approach, and yet, for whatever reason, it's not been emulated very much at all, at least to my knowledge. Yeah. I think that'd be up to, I mean, to really answer your question, that was all Yoko Kano, and that was all her, and we were just, we got it done already, and with the music in there, I have every CD ever made from this series. I love the music so much, and I continue to listen to it today. Um, and it was revolutionary, I think, but there was something about Bebop that it was really sort of a love letter to the West, uh, a merging of, of Japanese and, and American uh, I guess creative ideas in terms of, of music and animation and fighting and well, you definitely movies. Had a lot, you definitely had a, a lot of east-west fusion. Yeah, without a doubt, which has never really happened before from what I can see. So we sort of call it the gateway drug for anime. If people are like, I don't like ninjas. And I was like, okay, we'll try this. 
because there's an episode that is basically combined Alien with 2001, and you've got this completely symphonic uh, soundtrack, as well as the jazz and everything else. I mean, it's not just the jazz that she did. She did opera and uh, punk rock and, and arcade music, and it, it was a tour de force for Yoko Kano, and it told the story as much as the acting and the animation did. Yeah, unfortunately, that is a question for her. When when we got our hands on it, it was a complete package. So that's that's definitely a Yoko Kano. Well, there's, there, there's still my second question, which is why it hasn't it uh, become more pop as a musical approach? Why it hasn't? It, I think it depends on the project. Yeah. You know, I mean, if there's a lot of, I don't think it would work for Attack on Titan. I don't think it would work <laughs> for uh, Death Note. Or you know, unfortunately, I'm not up on the newer anime right now, but. It seems to me that it really sort of depends on the world, and there aren't that many worlds of anime where you end up in a casino, you end up with a you know a costume party where it's, I mean it, it's it was a really unique piece, and I think because of that the, the music reflected that. So I'm not sure why people don't do yeah. it. I've been asking that question for years too, and I listen to the soundtrack in my car all the time. Yeah. So it certainly wasn't overlooked by us. We were very aware of how awesome that was. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, big fans. Um, I loved you in Transformers Prime and Starscream. Oh, thank you. You still have to call me Lord. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and I loved you as Zara. Uh, my question... Thank you, Johnny. I was wondering if Zara would ever come back to Critical Role, and Steve, if you had any thoughts of joining the show, even for a one-off. <laughs> I'd love it if Zara came back. She's fabulous. I think she's tired. I think after... <laughs> Slaying the Dragon and the Beholder. I think she's rather tired. and she's, she's, she's been put here to do research to see whether or not this world is actually worth saving. So we'll see. You know, I, I, think I came up with an idea today of what she would be doing after the time jump. Uh, Chris, if Chris is here, it's only going to be thanks to Chris. He was standing in front of me and I came up with this idea. So I'm going to run it by Matt if he ever wants us back on, which I hope he does. Will and I are like, come on, man. He was back on the show, man. So tweet Matt Mercer and get us back on the show. Yeah. And for me, I'm just starting to learn how to play D&D for the first time, so I'm a little bit intimidated. I don't want to create a TPK because I love those people. Um, I'm just afraid I'm going to make some terrible mistake. Um, so I'm, I'm learning the game, and maybe once I feel a little more comfortable with it, I'd love to come on the show. It'd be really fun. I, I know all those people really well, and I love them. And if they would have me, I'd probably come on the show and eat their chicken. So. Yeah. Thank you. Those oh, secrets, come on. No secrets, Al. Come on. Spike Spiegel. Nice. Hi. Um, so I think Cowboy Bebop is one of my favorite anime series. Um, and as a voice actor, your voice is just great. And I think if you were to define cool, it would be Spike Spiegel. I agree. Um, I was just wondering, what is personally one of your favorite Cowboy Bebop episodes? Oh, man. Well, I love them all for different reasons. Lately, I've been thinking about uh, Toys in the Attic. Yeah. Mm. We've, um, just because it was so weird, and we've done that as a live reading. Um, and Mushroom Samba, just because it was oh. also so bizarre. Seriously. <clears throat> but I love them all for different reasons. I mean, so many of them are standalone anyway. Um, uh, the one with the, uh, the move, moving like water, I don't remember what the, the name of that episode was. Th yes, thank you. Well, yeah, yeah. Tommy was, uh, was were you, were, like, you had the apprentice? Yeah, we were, yeah, I had the apprentice, and we were doing the Bruce Lee kind of moves. I thought that was amazing, because yeah. I'm a Bruce Lee fan. So, so many amazing moments in that. And the movie is probably my favorite of all. Mm -hmm. I just, I love the way the movie played, beginning to end. It's awesome. I love Pierre Olafu, too. Yeah, yes. Oh, man. Pierre, he, he freaked me out. It was so scary. And I, I actually came up with that line at the end, man, I hate the parks. Only because I had worked at one, and I was, I don't know why I love theme parks, but I just thought that Spike would hate Yeah, them. no, Spike would hate theme parks, especially after that. Yeah. We also came up with that shit shiitake on ice at the yes. end of Mushroom Samba, which was... <laughs> and got away with it. And got away with it because it's shiitake mushrooms. Right. It's all in the yeah. pronunciation. Thank you for watching the show. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right. Hello. Hi. Hello. I actually have a request for Steve. Do the voice. <laughs> Do the voice. Uh, 
Um, so there are so many amazing scenes in Cowboy Bebop, and there was one that I found like really hilarious is when Spike is talking to Jed about how the three things that he hates. Could you possibly do that? <laughs> I'm going to my cheat sheet. I know this one, but I'm going to read it anyway, just because I want to get it right. All right. Jed, you know there are three things that I particularly hate. Kids, animals, and women with attitudes. So tell me, Jed, why do we have all three of them neatly gathered on our ship? <laughs> Thank you. One of my favorite ones, too. I love that. If, if you two, since you two are married, uh, can we write slash fix about you people now? <laughs> We're not, we're not married yet. No, not yet. My apologies. Could happen. Could happen. Anything could happen at a con. What was the question? Right. What was the question, though? That was the question. Oh, are we, not yet. Are we married? That was the question. No, if they could write, if they could write. Our hearts are married. Oh. Our souls are married. Exactly. We don't need a ring for our love. Says you. Yeah. What? <laughs> Not kidding, pal. God, I'm wow. in Jersey. Oh. Hello. How are you? So, uh, first of all, I want to say that it's a pleasure to meet both of you. I've researched you for a long time. I know about you. I've been Steve. I've been a fan of yours since Digimon from Gurren Logan all the way up until now. Oh, thanks, hon. When you screw it and give it a hard manly twist. <laughs> I actually do a pretty good impression of that, but uh, what I wanted to ask you was what it's like uh, to work on Toonami uh, currently. Oh, yeah. Because big fan over here, so we wrote a whole page on Toonami Legacy on our blog, so... Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, Toonami has been a long, wonderful, winding road, and it's because of you guys that we're back on the air now, so yeah. give yourselves a hand for that. Um, it's... It's amazing working on it now after all these years because I'm working with mostly the same people. Uh, the same editors are there, the same writers are there. The only person who's left is Sean Akins, who's one of the original creators, but Jason and Gil are still there. And uh, we're actually doing like a little mini tour this year because it's our 20th anniversary. Um, so it's, it's more alive and well than it's ever been. We're bringing new shows onto the air and bringing back some old good stuff. And uh, I'm still recording in my home studio every week and over the phone with the guys in Atlanta. Um, but we're still listening to what you guys are saying every week. We want to get your favorite stuff on the air as much as we possibly can. But it, it still has exactly the same feel to me that it did 17 years ago when I started doing this. And I'm so disappointed that Sonny Strait isn't here this weekend. This would have been the opportunity to meet him for the first time in person. Sonny and I have sort of known each other through email and uh, for years, but he's the guy who, well, after Moltar, he was the original Tom. And I just wanted to shake his hand and thank him for that, for starting this journey, you know. And, and uh, it's an amazing thing for me, especially to hear the stories from you guys year after year coming to these cons and how the inspirational pieces have gotten people through hard times and these shows have helped people to grow up and, and make it in life that gets a little bit difficult sometimes, so. You're, you're my childhood hero from... Oh. oh. So, the Dude. whole speech, the whole speech from the positivity, I listen to it almost all the time. So from which one? Positivity. The oh, positivity is awesome, yeah. Yeah, I listen to it almost all the time, so you're my childhood hero. Wow, man, I wish I had that one with me. I'd do it live for you, but I don't. So, yeah. Well, if I'm somebody serious, can pull that up on a phone, I'll, I'll do that one live, if you like. I've got fall down seven times. You guys want to hear that one? Yeah? yeah? All right. All right. <laughs> so here's the deal. Life doesn't always want to be your friend. Sometimes it'll feel like life wants to hurt you, but you can't just hide. Nobody likes a quitter. You got to take chances. They never said it was going to be fun or easy. Whether it's when you're totally ready or when you least expect it, it doesn't matter. Life will punch you right in the face. Now you can lie there for a second, cry a little if you need to, but get back on your feet, because it's the getting back up that counts. That's what shows you've got heart. That's what helps keep you going. You fall down seven times, get up eight, and know we'll be right there with you. Only Tsunami on Adult Swim.
<laughs> it still gives me feels. I love that. Ooh, I mean, talk about something. Who asked the question about you know what's inspirational? That's inspirational. That's yeah. inspirational. That's and it's a part of anime. It, it ties it all together with Adult Swim and everything. Yeah. And, it's, and we need it now. You know, these are troubling times sometimes, and you need inspiration to get back up because that's def that defines who you are. And we got to lift each other back up too, which yeah. is really important. That's what I love about these cons is that. So many of us, I know I did, I felt like I was sort of an outsider growing up. I was bullied and I was really insecure. And coming to cons, we can be anybody who we want to be. And there's no judgment and we all lift each other up. And that's, that's the way we heal this place. So. Fly that freak flag high. Absolutely. I'm proud. I'm proud. All right, Lady Spike, here we go. Me too, one let's jam. Bang, bang. <laughs> Well, I guess I have the best record for traveling. I only traveled four blocks to get to this convention this yes. year. Yes! Yeah, all right. Did you drive? No, I just walked here. Oh, good. I live, I live four of blocks me. away. Um, so, I didn't know you were doing the, the Tangled series. I'm like super hyped now because I love Disney. I am cra I'm a crazy nerd. I guess that's why I'm going into film and animation. Awesome. But um, I have a, my question is, is that so, how, what's the difference, like, you know, working with, like, a very, like, high-profile, like, company like Disney when it comes to putting together cartoons and animations that are from, like, existing properties that are so big? Because I think the Tangled show is really good. Thank it you. does not get enough credit. It works so well as a TV show, and I think part of it is because the voice acting is so good. Thank you. Wow. It's, well, there's, uh, they're amazing actors, and we really, Chris Sonnenberg, who's the executive producer, minds Broadway. So he went in, and he's like, I, he's a big musical theater guy, and he's like, I want that voice. I want the show to sound unlike anything that I've heard before. He has such respect for voice acting, but he's like, I want to bring in new people. I want to bring in Broadway actors, and actors who know what it's like to perform, but maybe not necessarily behind a mic. And that's where I come in to sort of nudge them and direct them and get out of their way so that we can pull something sort of wonderful out of out of them. And in terms of being completely terrified, absolutely 100%, again, it's just knocking the monkey off your shoulder that says you're going to fail and jumping out of the plane, you know? Because the process is still the same. If I'm directing Steve uh, in anime or, or, or Melissa Fawn or Wendy Lee in anime, it's the same experience as directing Steve in Tangled. It's a very intimate experience with producer, me, uh, engineer and then actor in the booth. Uh, there's another show we're doing right now where we get all the actors in the booth, but for this, it's just, it's the same thing, and that's all I have to tell myself. It's the same thing. It's a very high profile thing, and I just can't let that kind of pressure get the best of me, you know? And if I get knocked down, I pick myself up and just get up and do it again, you know? So it's amazing. I'm so excited. I, I just love Tangled, and I love the series, and Everybody on it is so great, and there's so much love that's put into this show. I hope you guys check it out. It's on tonight. It's like Liberty. It's probably just airing again, but it's airing again. It's wonderful. Yeah, that, that's really awesome. It's kind of like X Men: The Animated Series when they brought in like the Shakespearean esque actors. I think that yeah. really makes <clears throat> oh, like, wait elevates the animation. Well, it's amazing too because on a, on a lot of animated shows or movies where they bring in on camera celebrities you don't always get the best performances. On this show, I think it's exactly the opposite of that. Mandy Moore and Zach Levi are Whoa. ridiculously talented people and they yeah. really put everything into it. They sweat in the booth and, yeah. and they go for it. And I finally got to meet Zach at a convention last week and he's a sweetheart, he's a really nice guy. I was really intimidated because he's such a big star, but oh, he's, yeah, he's, he's a really cool guy. Thank he's you. my very best friend in the world, Zach Levi. Yes, he he's is. My very best <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. And Steve, Thank you. it's okay. After one year, you're going to be a really intense D&D player, and you're gonna, it's going to fill a lot of voids in your life. Right? Oh, boy. He's going to be so confident uh, every time he's like, I would like to rage. I'm like, yes, you want to rage. Uh, I'm going down that rabbit hole. It's going to oh, get ugly. So much fun. Yep. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to thank you again for being a big part of all of our childhoods. Oh. Yay. Oh. Please apologize to your parents for me for the <laughs> trouble I might have gotten in. Oh, it's all good, actually. Uh, we watched anime together, so. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and my question for you guys was, uh, how did you both individually, like, get into voice acting? Mm. Oh. 
it's... I came at it from the complete opposite way. Yeah. I studied a lot. I went to Bucknell and I got a degree in theater. Uh, not sure that Bucknell was known for theater at the time. It is now, which is nice. Uh, and then I went to grad school in uh, Texas and I kept going west because I really wanted to be on Star Trek. Uh, really badly. I'd been doing Shakespeare for years and I was like, this is awesome, I want to do this. And, uh, and I did, I went to the Globe Theater and then finally in San Diego and then moved up to LA and I was doing some on-camera stuff. Xena, Warrior Princess, a horse named Cher, reared up and fell on top of me and dislocated my kneecap and I started, came back to LA and I started, a friend of mine, uh, Peter Spellos, introduced me to Zero Limit Production that was doing Akira and the Big O and uh, so I started doing that and I think I got the Wanderers. I was a voice match for an actress who left who sounded like Kate Mulgrew. So I was Mr. Jedi, and it was very Kate Mulgrewish. And that's the time when I got on Star Trek Voyager, was when I was doing that part, and Kate Mulgrew came in on the last day and said, so how was your time on Voyager? And I was this close to saying, my time on Voyager was wonderful, how was yours? <laughs> but that would have been bad. Uh, and that was it, I felt, uh, coming from a theater background, I, it was, it's all about character development, you know, and rehearsal and taking the time. And on camera, it's not so much about that, at least not on the, the C and D list shows that I was doing. Uh, it was about, we're two pages behind, you say your line's right, we're gonna move on. So if you don't like it, screw up. I'm like, ah, okay. So, but with, for some reason, with, with uh, just isolating your voice in a booth was much more creatively satisfying. For me, I didn't have to worry about my weight, my anything, you know what I mean, or hitting my mark, or memorizing my lines. I could just go in in a very pure situation and build a character, which I just thought was fantastic. And as a director, it's like, if, especially with anime, it was like doing one instrument at a time of a huge symphony and seeing where the story goes and the crescendo and where it's going to come down to. So I love the intimacy of voiceover. Plus, it's one of the most generous, amazing communities. Uh, in Los Angeles. I, I can't really say that for the on-camera because my experience of that wasn't that. It was hard. <laughs> and not that it's not supposed to be hard, but it was miserable hard. It wasn't like, this is great, it's hard, and I'm enjoying it. It was this, this is miserable, and I'm, I'm hurting myself by doing this. It just wasn't for me. So the minute I got into voiceover, I was like, oh, this, this is where I belong. This is where I belong. And I got in by accident. <laughs> I've been doing... <laughs> I've been like a, I've been a class clown my whole life and doing ridiculous voices since I was a little boy. I think my journey really started uh, when I got my first answering machine back in the days when we had answering machines with a cassette tape. And I got this machine. I'm playing around with it, and I thought I did a pretty good goofy impression. So I just recorded on thing. Oh, stay can't come to the phone. Some silly like that. And I get this wrong number. This guy calls, he calls the wrong number, and I hear him laughing on the message. And he goes, dude, you gotta hear this, and click. And then he calls back a couple minutes later. And I get, I get like 10 calls in a row from this guy, and he's calling all his friends and telling them to call me. And then this goes on for about a week, and then they start telling me to change the voice. So they said, dude, that's getting old, do something else. And I went, okay, I'll do this voice. So I, so I do. I go through every stupid voice that I thought I did a pretty good job on, and I, I started changing it literally every week. And I didn't think I was going to ever make a living at that, though. I wanted to be a musician. I was playing in an R&B band during the 80s, opening for heavy metal acts, and that was not going well. He had a mullet. I had a mullet. I he wore, wore spandex. red netting. Yeah, I shaved half of my head. I wore spandex. Gold lame. I played in a 15 Hammer time pants. Stage band. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, so to support that habit, I got a day job uh, in a film company working in their mailroom. One of my buddies needed some help in the mailroom and working in a warehouse. And uh, it was called Empire Entertainment. We made movies like Reanimator and Ghoulies and things like that. It was pretty popular at the time. But I didn't know anything about film, didn't really care anything about film. Everybody else in the building was an actor. And the head of the mailroom, a guy named Victor Garcia, needed a deep voice for a Japanimation thing that he was doing on a weekend. So he said, dude, if you try out for this, I'll give you free breakfast and free lunch. And literally, I didn't hear anything about the Japanimation thing. I didn't hear about acting. All I heard was free breakfast and lunch because I was a starving musician. So I decided to give it a try, and I was terrified. I went to the studio. It was literally in a treehouse. Uh, <laughs> half of it backed up to a, a 
a, a cliff and we called it the cave. It was like dug out and it was terrible. The sound in there was terrible. We had to lug all the equipment up every day. Uh, nobody knew how to do anime at the time. And they brought in all the actors at the same time, which is not the way you do it. You bring in one actor at a time. Otherwise you can't isolate the sound. So I'm in this room. They show me a picture of this creature called a zoonoid on a show called The Giver. And they said, all right, so we're gonna show you the scene where this creature rips the arm off of another creature and beats him with it, or something like that. And they said, what would that sound like? And they showed me this visual on the screen and I went, okay. <laughs> he said, all right, you're hired. <laughs> and I went, really? Okay, so I get lunch tomorrow too? And that's all I cared about. So literally, I just, I watched what all the other actors were doing and I stole everything I could. I went, okay, so if I'm gonna do words, I actually have to do that. And and it's some of the greatest actors in LA working on this show. And I literally did, through 26 episodes of the show, they eventually gave me a speaking role. I played the main bad guy in the show. Through 26 episodes of this, watching the other actors and stealing everything they did, I sort of learned how to do the work. And this company, for some stupid reason, kept hiring me. <laughs> and so I did it on the side for about 15 years. I stayed at that film company. I became an executive at that film company. I was head of marketing. And one day, I, I hated what I was doing because it became very corporate, and I booked a 7-Eleven commercial. I was the guy who said, oh, thank heaven. I don't know if you guys have 7-Elevens here. Yeah, but I was that guy. And I thought, okay, this is my ticket out. I'm getting out of the film business. I'm gonna go into voiceover, and 7-Eleven is gonna buy my house. And then the union went on strike. And I was out of work for like a year and a half, and supporting myself by credit cards and everything else I could. I was working three jobs and I had kids by that time. And it was a terrifying time, but I had to make a choice whether to commit to voice actor or not, voice acting or not, and I did. And that was age 40. And uh, started doing it full time, whether people were paying me or not. And I haven't looked back since, and so far it's worked out. But it was, it's not a path that I would recommend to anybody because it took almost two decades to be able to support myself at it. But I did it because I loved it in the very beginning, and that is the piece of advice that I would pass along. If that's something you're getting into, do it because you love to do it, never for fame or fortune. No. Even if you achieve those things, if you don't do it because you love to do it, those are empty. So, yeah. anyway, it worked out. I got two thumbs up. Is that good advice? <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, okay, I hope I phrase this correctly. Of all the characters out there that you have not voiced yet, who's your number one pick to voice? Of the ones that we haven't voiced? Yes. The oh. next one we're hired for. Yeah, whatever we're doing on Monday, because it means we're still working. No. <laughs> for me, it's probably Javi Feierstein. <laughs> I love that voice, and I don't get to do it, because he's already doing it. He's got the pod already. <laughs> for me, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, because I love him. He's wonderful. He gets to the job on time and I love him. <laughs> this, is, this is a funny little side note. When, whenever Mary is directing me and we don't have a lot of other people around, I will not leave the booth until she says, Get out of the booth! Do it now! Get out! I won't leave. I'll just sit there. I'll just sit there and wait. Do it! Yeah. Time's over. Uh, it's so sexy when you do that. I like uh, 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 these kinds of things. No uh, 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 See why I'm in love with her. Uh, it's not hard to love a person who can do that. Uh, it's very close to animal, so I've always also been working on that. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Thank you very much. Hi. Okay, so. Well, that is weird. Okay, so. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I. Um, never dubbed an anime, but I can only imagine how hard it is to lip sync everything and how many like outtakes it takes. But um, my question was, since you um, dub, I mean, well, not really dub, but um, you, well, yeah, dub over people like Tom and like um, Tom and uh, Amon, people with like masks or people you don't have to look at their lips. Yeah. Uh, how much easier is that to dub <laughs> than people you have to actually look at the lips and lip sync? So much easier, dude. <laughs> so much easier. Yeah, but you know what? I love the dubbing process. I kind of cut my teeth on it, and I love the challenge of it. So anytime I get to do anime now, I, I love going back in the studio because it, it gets that skill set going, and it gets that part of my brain working again that can sometimes atrophy. 
So I don't mind doing it at all. I love every minute of it. But we can certainly go a lot faster when I don't have to match lip flaps. Yeah. So yeah, but for Amon, that was actually an interesting one. I was actually a little disappointed that he rarely showed his face in that show because I wanted to create something more with the character. But Andrea Romano and all of her genius, I, I actually started recording him on with a very broad type of voice. And she brought me way back into that very quiet place, which was chilling and worked so well for it and actually created a, a better acting experience for me, even though I didn't have to match the lip flaps. So yeah, it was, it was great. I love both things for different reasons. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, again, um, what, to both of you, what advice would you give to people who want to voice act but have a very limited vocal range? Because I, I would love to do it, I just love cartoons and I love that people, like voice actors, bring these cartoon characters to life because a cartoon character is nothing without a voice. Yeah. You give them voices. So what would you say to someone that has a limited vocal range? Well, first of all, I love you because you've got a deep voice. And as a woman, we're, it's, it is limited. I mean, it's just they don't, they don't think of you for anything else sometimes unless, you know... You go in and you start doing that. Honestly. And it's, just, and it's hard, but what you can find are the subtleties. And you find that it's, it's more about building a character than it is using a voice. Because we're always going to... Like, Nicolas Cage always plays Nicolas Cage. But he plays different characters, right? He's always going to be him. So it's going to look like, well, except for the John Travolta movie where he took his face off. But <laughs> for the most part, it's him. So you find what's unique about the characters, and you play the characters. Like Zara on Critical Role is very much sort of in here. But Governor Price is kind of the same awful, awful voice because she's a terrible human being. So it's the same voice, but the characters are very different, and somehow it sounds different. You know? The other thing is, is to. <clears throat> play around, start to, I mean, these are muscles. So if you work them out, you can actually train your voice to go a little higher than you normally would, or even to go a little deeper than you normally would. I think I'm good on that. Yeah, I know. You're pretty deep. It's pretty <laughs> fantastic. Um, but there are people like Don LaFontaine, who's no longer with us, but he's the trailer guy. He's the guy who did your inner world, <laughs> but now one man. He literally had one voice, and he was probably the richest of any voice actor I've ever heard of. Oh, Amazing. He, was, yeah. he built an entire career on that. But he could also change that tone so that it was a happy Disney voice or it was a terrible, terrifying, scary voice. All the same dude, all the same voice, but yeah. it was all the inflection and the acting ability. There's and a lot of range. It's like the Beatles, so how, many, you know, how many songs have been written with four chords, yeah. right? Same so thing. it's the same thing. If you only have a four note range, or if, you're, you know, if you only have got a one octave range, that doesn't mean you aren't going to be as good an actor as someone with a three octave range. What you do with that octave is unique and yours. Yeah. So make it unique and yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, yeah. for continuing to inspire. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh. Hey. Hey, how you doing? Hey. Yes. Yeah. Um, you guys are amazing. Uh, I was, my question is for Steve. Um, during the early 2000s of Tsunami, what was it your idea or the producer ideas when they when you first created the uh, don't feel fa don't fear failure uh, video? So was it your idea or? Uh, <laughs> The producer's idea. 99.999% of the stuff on Tsunami is not my idea. <laughs> I'm the voice monkey. I'm literally just, you know, the robot in a box who comes in and records it every week. Um, I certainly give my input if I think something isn't flowing right or, you know, I want to add something and they're really cool about letting me do that. But those guys are geniuses. They know exactly what they're doing. They're really in touch with the fan base. And it's Jason and Gill who are putting that stuff together week by week these days, and the editors who are making it all work. So I can't take credit for any of that. I'd love to, but I can't. Right. Cool. Yeah. Or the video game reviews. <laughs> I'm not a gamer, so you know, I, I try to read them as clearly as I can, and, and you know, create uh, an experience for you guys. But it's basically them on the other end of the phone, and I can hear them tapping on their controllers. I know that they're playing like fiends on the other side. So it's all very authentic. But I'm just the mouthpiece. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Okay. Only Tsunami on Adult Swim. Yay! Always plug it when I can. Hey. Hi. 
Um, I'm a little nervous right now. Aw, oh, don't be. It's all good, dude. Deep cleansing breath. So, Spike. Yes. Was it difficult to see you die when you got blasted? <laughs> it's difficult to see Spike get blasted? Yeah. No, man. It's all good. I can take a punch. How many times did he get messed up? Spike got messed up a lot. I mean, on the final episode of Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, but I'm still... But you know what? But you know what? Spoilers! Here's the thing. But here's the thing. Here's the Sorry. thing. No matter what happened in that final episode, we don't know. Spike is right here with Julia, baby. Yeah. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you. No, I don't mind it though. I, I I like taking a punch. It's all good. I don't mind if I even go down. It's good. If it if it adds to the story, then I'm there to support the writers. Thanks, man. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> all right, especially with all the talk with Jersey. I feel like Megas XLR needs to be Virgin Hands! But I think Megas XLR needs some attention right now. So do you love giant robots? Or do you dig giant robots? Do you dig robots? Chicks dig giant robots. Nice! Yeah! Jersey, you don't make you don't make, you don't make XLR? Nice! Exactly. Watch Megas XLR if you haven't, because chicks do jig. Green skin space chicks. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> it's not Gamora. <laughs> no. Not Ga well, sure, she's green skin, why not? Oh, Hera. Hera's, a yeah. green Hera's green skin. Oh, that would just be wrong. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, Hera. She's kind of like mom. That'd be bad. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, my question is for both of you. Have you ever, have you ever done method acting or known anyone who's prepared before entering the booth in terms of method acting? Yeah, it happens a lot. It's interesting when you, we get met, method actors uh, who come in and they're like, all right, so we need you running. Okay. Okay, awesome. So plant your feet and now I need to hear it in the voice. So that's the one thing about um, being a voice actor is that you can like, I've worked with a lot of like um, mocap actors who that's all they did, they were stunt guys and women, and when they were like, <clears throat> it's like, okay, so now we need to hear it. So it's, it's, it's interesting to, to work with actors who are very method and really get into it, and, and, uh, and they'll be off mic and the whole time they're doing the scene like that. And I was like, that's brilliant. But it's, it's like singing in the rain, it's, oh, puppy, yeah. You know, it's like, you gotta stay on mic, you know, so there's, it's interesting to, uh, to sort of teach method actors, like you can be as method as you want and do what you need to do to get into character, but when it comes down to it, there's a very specific technique that you need to have uh, and to utilize as a voice actor, which is stay on target, you know, you've got to talk into the mic and you can't pop everything, you know, you've got to be able to use a mic and everything else. And once you get that, then you can be as method as you want, as long as you don't get any foley or hitting it, or which happens sometimes. It's, there's, there are a lot of physical actors that come in uh, to the booth, and you know people want to move around, and I'm like, that's great, just stay on mic. Yeah, but you just got to learn how to do it, and you look ridiculous. That's the whole. That's the most difficult thing I think for method actors is to let go of the fear of looking ridiculous. Um, that's something I, I just don't care about, honestly. But like. When I'm in a fight scene, for example, uh, I was doing a scene with Fred Tattashore, who plays the Hulk, and I was playing Wolverine. They actually had to separate us because our arms were flailing so far they thought we were going to knock each other out. So we're throwing punches, but our face is staying perfectly steady on the mic. And so we must look ridiculous. It must look like we're, we're having a seizure or something. Cause, <laughs> you know, the voice is staying the same, but the arms are going all over the place. So it's, it's a skill set, it's just a different skill set. So if you do come in with the method acting thing, you have to pull that back and be able to stay on mic. Yeah. That's, that's the key thing, that's the most difficult thing of all, I think. And sometimes if it does, then as, as engineers and as, as the studio would then make an adjustment. If someone is never going to be on mic, they're going to put a lavalier, they're going to put some, you know, they're going to mic you multiple ways yeah. so that you don't have, to, so that you can be this. You're like, I just need to talk, man, you know, it's like, it don't have to be focused here sometimes. If there's budget for it, they'll, they'll put it all out there. But 
At the end of the day, if you clap during a take, we can't use it because the character might not clap, you know? So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. welcome. Good question. Yeah. Hi. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Hi. Um, I know, Steve, you did a lot of voices for uh, Blizzard from World of Warcraft. Yeah. And I know, Mary, you did a couple as well. Yeah. Um, do you have any voices from, uh, from them, from uh, Akama or anything up there? Oh, okay. I've, been, I've been directing a lot of Blizzard lately. Yeah. Do we have any voices? Like uh, lines from like a comma from a uh, World oh, Warcraft. From which character? Oh. Uh, a comma. The. A comma. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember a comma. Is the uh, the uh, the shaman for the uh, the goat people? Oh shaman man. Shaman for the goat people. I don't remember. Well, I, I guess. What do you sound like? Do the voice. And I'll... I can't do. That. <laughs> Steve, I'm not you. I remember. Uh, I mean, I could do a crusader line. You know. I pick up my sword and pick up my shield, join my crusade. That's sort of something of what she did. But uh, we've been doing we've been doing the new necromancer class. So I've been directing that with a number of other people and um, and we get to work we get to hear Zoltan Cool, which is really fun, which is Steve who's Zoltan. basically a head in a bag. Yeah. It's great. I'm a head in the bag, that I remember. And he was sort of down and he was great. Yeah, I, great. I don't remember that one, man. That's terrible. I'm not a gamer either. They're gonna hate me at Blizzard now. I'm so sorry. I, re I remember recording a character named Akama, but was it a big character? Yeah, he's huge. Really? Yeah, he's, really he's a really good character. I'm really embarrassed now. You know what, I'll work it out and maybe by the next um, Which game panel that we do. It was a World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft? World of Warcraft. Yeah. And was he like a scary character, an older character? What do you sound no, like? No, he's like a, kind of like a wise shaman who's kind of on your side during a couple side quests. Okay, so maybe you can direct me into that. Did now you have you're an my director. Accent? Give me a line that he would have said. Did he have an accent? Um, I, I actually don't know. I don't remember. But he's a <laughs> great character. Great character. So you have the advantage to so, do anything. Yes. Yeah, give me something. So was he older like this? That's old. I like that. Yes. <laughs> We'll take that, you're hired. <laughs> Don't play on the freeway. <laughs> How about that? Is it, Excellent. I have no idea, dude. Now I gotta look this up, now I have homework, thanks a lot. <laughs> also play it. A comma, I'm gonna write this down. A, a comma. Right, continue, talk. It's punctuation. Okay. Sorry. That's Hi. terrible. <laughs> From Jersey, what do you want? Hey. Hi, Jersey. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, that I didn't realize you guys did so many voices in my childhood, like Digimon, I didn't know about that, and all the ones, so that was very cool, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and the other thing was, out of all the roles you've done, which one has stuck with you the most? Like, that you remember the most, and just worked the hardest on? Gosh, it really depends on the day. What's nice is, you know, with the Ghost in the Shell movie coming out, uh, I've sort of thrust, oh, yeah, out. It's out. I haven't seen it yet. But it's, uh, it's... Burning hands! Burning hands! Burning hands! <laughs> I have to go switch my spells around. I need to have burning hands now. Um, so the major has sort of come back, which is great, into my life, which is awesome. But then directing this new Necromancer series, I'm also going back through the entire... Uh, playing the Crusader. So it's really fun to sort of like hear somebody else saying the lines that the Crusader said, but tweaked for his character or her character as the necromancer. But it kind of depends on the day. Right. Uh, and when we come here, it's always Spike and Julia, always, 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 which is... You guys have for several years for that? Pardon me? Like, you've come for several pan panels over and over again for this one? Like, for Cowboy Bebop? Yeah, we oh, usually okay. end up doing lots of Bebop panels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry that we didn't know that, that, that we're going to be showing a show. Yeah, Which episode were you guys going to show? Okay. Okay, good. Look, we're here for you guys. Okay. Oh, so, you know, we can all sit in the dark room together and watch a show, or we can talk. I know, it's you better know? to talk. We like to see your faces, too. I know, it's so You guys are amazing. And your cosplays are ridiculously amazing, by the way. You guys I know. Are incredible. Makes me yeah. so happy. I love it. Yeah. And I think everybody should wear onesies all the time. Yes. They're the most comfortable. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, you're wearing, are the onesies not the most comfortable thing ever? Oh, it's a cloak? Oh. It looks like a onesie. Just lie to me. All you have to do is just lie to me. I would totally rock that. <laughs> so, what, what was the question? Our favorite character? Something that stuck, stuck with you. Oh, something stuck with us? Yeah. Well, Tom, because I do them every week and I have been for so long. Yeah. Um, and lately, <laughs> Probably Zabarellios, just because I've been playing him so much lately. That's yeah. one. Which series is that? Is it Star Wars Rebels. Star Wars Rebels, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, it's on Disney XD. Check it out. It's I amazing. Will. Just finished season three. 
Like We're going to do season four now, so catch up. I will. Yeah. Yes. Thank you guys so much. Great, thank Only you. Only the Empire. Yes. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good, how are you? I just want to say this is my first uh, Zenkai Con. I Yay! I drove to my buddies right there. They're right there filming me right now. Hey, nice. Welcome, guys. Nice. I just wanted to say, uh, Steve, I know you played Mugen on Samurai Champloo. Yeah. I just... <laughs> I just going to ask, uh, since it's such like a unique anime and all that, and I have to show it to a lot of my friends because it's awesome, I just want to know, what was it like working on that? I know it's pretty vague, but... It was really fun. At first, it was really intimidating because it wasn't too long after Bebop that I was working on that. And I wanted to do something completely different with the voice, because it's basically my speaking voice. And they said, no, we want this voice. We want you to do this voice. Yeah. And the whole Japanese crew was there in the room monitoring every single word that I said. So it was a lot more structured than Bebop was. We had a lot more playtime with Bebop. Yeah. Um, so it was a little more intimidating to do that and to make sure that everybody was happy. That was really my goal, was just to make sure that the, the Japanese client was happy and that it was true to the original Japanese version. So as long as we got that right, I was okay. But I love the character. I still haven't seen it all the way through. Are you seeing it? I've seen like seven episodes, I think. I know. That guy right there. But here's the thing, you go, especially working on anime yep. series, you'll go in yep. and do three, four episodes at a time. Then you go away for two months and you come back in and you don't get the scripts beforehand. You go in by yourself, you see your stuff, and then you go away, you know, and it's, it's hard to catch up. And then we don't get copies for years. So yeah. we got copies a few years back, and, and when I got the copy, I started watching it, and then we'd go out on tour, we'd be doing these conventions, and working in between, there's just no time. I'm a grown-up now, you know, I got, I got work to do. So one of these days I'm going to watch it. I still have it very carefully packed away in my studio. I look at it all the time, and I will check it out at some point. All right, yo, thanks, man. All I remember Thank is you. nookies and dumplings. That was it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, hey uh, this is for both of you, but I'm just going to intro through Steve. Um, I know you guys have a huge breadth of work, portfolio-wise, a lot of different characters. Um, you're doing Zeb right now. I love yes, I Rebels, it's great. Carabast. <laughs> Rebel scum. <laughs> Are you ever uh, sad? Say goodbye to a character after you've done your work? I mean, I know you kind of oh. say the work is kind of piecemeal, you do it here, you do it there, but I mean, like, you've done Rebels for the last three seasons. This is the last season, right? Yeah, so, I'm just curious. Yeah, we were just at Star Wars Celebration in Orlando a couple of weeks oh. ago, and uh, Dave Filoni announced that season four is going to be our final season on the show. And I'm broken hearted, honestly. I, I've fallen in love with these characters, and, and the cast has become family. Mary's part of that cast, too, with Governor Price. Um, even though she's evil, she's still part of our family. Um, but yeah, I mean, even when we're not at conventions, we're texting each other all the time. The, the cast members have become really, really close, and all of us are super invested in the Star Wars universe. So yeah, we're really, really sad to see that go. On the other hand, uh, Dave Filoni is the main storyteller in this franchise. He and his team at Lucasfilm uh, know the story arcs from beginning to end and know how they integrate with the movies that are to come. And Dave didn't have the opportunity to end Clone Wars on his own terms. And this time he gets to do that. And so out of utter respect for him, we're happy that he gets to tell the story the way he wants to tell the story and end it the way he wants to end it. Yeah. So we're grateful just to be there to help him do that. Yeah, but still broken hearted, dude. Oh, it hurts. Do you have no, it's always sad to let, but we come back to cons and we get to relive them with you and yeah. people and hear how it affected your life and then it brings us back to how it affected ours and it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It lives on forever. Yeah. Star Wars, man. It never goes anywhere. I know. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're going to have another hard oh, one. Oh, hello. Good evening again. The answer is green. He's holding a cattle prod behind me, so <laughs> um, the entertainment industry and Silicon Valley have been working like mad to reproduce the human form digitally and to cross the uncanny valley, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and they're doing a very good job of it. Do you see similar efforts going on for doing the same with the human voice? Well, the thing about creating the human voice is you can get somebody in there to say every vowel, every consonant, every sound, and record it and then manipulate it, but I call it the fly uh, equation. Uh, when, when Jeff Goldblum, 
I'm such a nerd. When Jeff Goldblum took the steak and put it from one pot to the next and Gina Davis tried it, he said, what's missing? She's like, the flesh. We're missing the flesh. There's a spontaneity to human beings that cannot be calculated, I think. And until we get to a point with our AI that actually can come up with that level of spontaneity and quickness, uh, that there will always be the human element, the unpredictability of the human element that will be missing, uh, which is why Moff Tarkin came up so beautifully, but you still had a human doing the voice on all of it. You had this beautiful uh, CG version of Peter Cushing, who is no longer with us, but still, behind it, it wasn't Peter's voice, it was Stephen's, right? Yeah, Steve Stanton. Steve Stanton's voice. So it's the human element that will make something real, always. So until they can do that, I think we're okay. Yeah, we're, I think we're all right for a job. But we're hoping point. it remains that way for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, hello again. Hi. Oh, hello. Uh, yes, uh, and that, what that guy said about the don't fear failure thing is funny, because that's for those who like, uh, 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 Steve as Tom and Toonami. I'm going to show that clip. It's called Dreams as well as a recent year not. <laughs> um, well, actually, it was a Toonami comment. I really do appreciate it. They really were inspirational, and I just want to thank you guys for that. Thank you, thank man. you so appreciate much, that. guys. And you inspire us, too. I know yeah. we only have a few minutes left, so we're going to go through these really quick. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. We can do, do it. it. All right, so my question was, how did you guys um, practice different accents? Did you just watch a lot of British TV until you yes. picked it up, or did you talk in a crappy Australian accent until someone thought you were Australian? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people. Eliza Jane Schneider is an amazing coach. J.B. Blanc is an amazing dialect coach. So if you've got to learn something specific for a job, you'll definitely go in that. But you watch Game of Thrones enough, and you get every accent pretty much on the planet coming through Game of Thrones. Uh, I love watching movies for accents all the time. It's really fun. I, my Russian accent is keyed off of Helen Mirren in 2010. All I have to do is Dr. Floyd, and I'm there with a Russian accent. It's You find a key, you find a, that one springboard that gets you into it. You know? I do a crappy Australian accent until somebody pays me for it. So, you know, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily get better, but it gets lucrative. Yeah. <laughs> you go to the source, you know, it's like you yeah. can key into Parliament, you can actually watch Parliament and it's fascinating, you know, but if, if you know, you know nothing, Jon Snow, all of a sudden you're like, oh, all right, I'm in Northern England, you know, or somewhere along the line, it's fun. It's tough though, It's that's a tough thing to do, and there are people that can really help you with that. Eliza Jane Schneider and J.B. Blanc are two of our friends and they're brilliant dialecticians. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, Steve, I think I speak for everyone in this room when, it's, uh, when I say it's great to have you back in our lives as Tom. Oh. Um, my uh, question is, when did you find out that Tsunami was coming back and what was your reaction? <laughs> uh, well, I didn't know that it was coming back during the April Fool's thing. That was just a stunt. We were doing that as, as an April Fool's joke and as a gift to you guys. And the, the response was so crazy. Half of you hated us for it because you thought it was a cruel joke to play. And the other half thought, oh wait, maybe this can come back on the air. And I learned how to, to use Twitter that night. <laughs> Stayed up all night with you guys, went crazy, started doing the Twitter storms. And when you guys brought it back, I still wasn't sure if we could ever do it because the network just kept saying, no, 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 we don't have time for this. It has to prove itself, it has to make money, it's a network. And finally, because of you guys overwhelming them and shutting down their website over and over again, they finally said, fine, we'll give you a little slot for your little show, go ahead, but we're not giving you any money, you guys have to do it for free, basically. So they called me and they said, Steve, uh, the good news is that we we're, might be bringing Toonami back, the bad news is we can barely pay you for this. And I went, yes, I'm in, I don't care. And uh, don't tell my agent that. But, <laughs> But the first reaction was basically an eight-year-old fanboy squee. Uh, I could not believe that we had another shot at this. And, and now we're bringing it back to its final glory. And every week I'm just so excited and so grateful to you guys for supporting the show and bringing it back to what it was. Yeah. So thank you. And for the next generation to watch these shows, too. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So my question uh, in regards Shadows of the Damned, the project that you guys worked on together. Oh, yeah. What were your most challenging and favorite moments while you guys worked on that game? I'm curious, because that's one of my favorite ones. On which game? So we the... did this game called Shadows of the Damned, oh, and, of but the on Damned. different sides. Like, Steve was the lead, 
Hotspur. Garcia F. Hotspur. Yes. yes. He always had a big boner. That was his yeah. gun. That was his gun. That was what the gun was called. Do not be excited, parents. <laughs> Do not get... <laughs> and I was on the singing end. I worked with Akira Yamaoka for Silent Hill. I sang all the songs for the Silent Hill game series. Uh, and we uh, and actually got Troy Baker in. He's like, well, Mary, I need to get... I need a male voice. And I was like, I got it. You know, so uh, Troy came on very early in his career in Los Angeles. And uh, we had an amazing time, and we got to go to San Francisco uh, to do a press release and do a mini concert. And it's the first time Akira and I ever played live together with Troy. And as I was walking around, they had uh, kiosks set up where the media could play the game. And as I listened to it, I was like, wait a minute, that's Steve. And so that was really cool for me. I was like, oh my god, we're working on this game together. It's so cool. Well, yeah, that, that game was really funny. I came in at the very last second. The entire uh, game was recorded by a Castilian Spanish actor, and he had a beautiful voice, but it, it was, his accent was so thick they couldn't understand it. And they wanted to have a little bit more of a Mexican influence, because technically the character was Mexican. And so I just did basically a bad Mexican accent, Spanish-Mexican accent. And uh, we recorded the entire thing in one day. They were on a, a, a horrible deadline crunch, and so they said, we hired you because we know you can do this fast. And I think that's literally the only reason I did it. <laughs> so I came right. in as Garcia. I can't say his middle name because it's a naughty word. Garcia E. Hotspur, hunter of demons and slayer of pendejos like you. <laughs> and Still a fun wrong. I know, also a naughty word, I'm sorry, but not everybody in the room understands it, so that's good. Um, but the great thing was, years later, I went to one of these concerts that these guys were doing with Akira. Mm -hmm. And I, I just went for moral support, because we do that for each other sometimes. So I'm sitting next to her while she's signing autographs, and Akira is sitting there signing autographs. And all of a sudden, somebody brings up uh, a copy of this game. And I went, oh, I, I'm in that game. And Akira goes, what? So this? Nani? And, and Mary goes, yeah, Steve did the character of Garcia Hotspur. And he goes, what's <gasps> that? So good! And he gave me a big hug and Akita and I bonded over that. It was an amazing moment. Yeah, yeah so that was that was super fun. Yeah. And again, grab a, a grab a dialect that you're crappy at and just do it until somebody pays you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna be here all weekend, you guys. So come by, say hi, talk about and burn it hands, everybody! Burn it hands! We love you guys. Right so here much. at the events at 11.30 to 1, the voice actor panel. Yes. Yeah, 11.30 to 1, tomorrow, voice actor panel for more Bird in Hands. All right. Bird in Hands!